What's up, everybody? This is the Disciple Rick coming back to you again with another podcast. I know I've been away again for a minute. Uh, I apologize for that. I was wondering what was going on. I was uh, couldn't get my system to work the right way. Then I found out what it was. It took me a minute, but it was indeed my mixer was going out. And then it finally went out. So I had to get a new mixer. Okay, so I got that taken care of, but that's what was happening. Uh, My mixer went out. So I got me a new one now, and it sounds like, uh, looks like everything is working the right way. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this podcast. As you saw from the title, uh, that this podcast is really based on the scripture in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, really. But, of course, you know, it's in also Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I'm going to do this one in two parts because I think uh, the first part here, I'm going to set some things up for the second part. But I think that uh, both parts are important, but focus on one and then the other because I'm going to throw some things out here that might be a little surprising for you. Now, as it is uh, with most of my podcasts, there's really targeted towards ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's really for anybody. Uh, These things can be related to anyone who has been in a religion like Jehovah's Witnesses or has been in a religion, period. There's things that you can learn uh, from our experience uh, as former Jehovah's Witnesses for any religion, even though ours was more strict, you know, kind of like on that Mormon end, some close to Scientology and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's us. Uh, this, uh, these things are for anyone, not just ex Jehovah's Witnesses. Even though I don't know that the majority of you are ex Jehovah's Witnesses, but I want to talk about this topic about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now you know that the scripture, scripture came from Joel that Peter was quoting when he says, "Everyone who calls on the name of, as in the Jacob Bible says, Jehovah will be saved," and he related this to Pentecost. As Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, we talk somewhat about the spirit realm. In another podcast, I talk a lot about the spirit realm. But in the religion, uh, I I would say Jehovah's Witnesses do and do not believe in the spirit realm. So it's there, but the connection is uh, slight, I'm going to say. But they think that the spirit realm affects things around them and not there so it's not really taught Jehovah's Witnesses you know didn't teach much about demonic possession even though they believed in it somewhat I mean they, they believed in it somewhat they didn't think a Jehovah's Witness can be possessed demonically but their belief more or less leaned to where a person who was demon possessed was under demonic control and that the control was sacrificed uh, the, the individual control was sacrificed and then the demons took control of that person but then again they also believe that demons are fallen angels so that's why the stuff is, is quite confusing and they really didn't get into what they really believed about uh, demons or they didn't teach much on it let me just say that they didn't teach much on it uh, I'm going to address that later why I think they didn't teach it very much but I guess most religions don't either uh, the Catholics teach but then there's special exorcisms that you got to do and all that other stuff okay so but if for jehovah's witnesses no there was not much taught on uh demon possession but there was i will say in the organization among the people there was a fascination with demons uh i mean people talk about demons all the time i mean when you be at the congregation on field service and all that people would talk about the demons and they loved that discussion about demons so if they didn't talk and I guess because they didn't teach much on it they left it open for us in the congregations to think about what demon possession means so it was more of urban legend on demon possession than reality and so that was what it was but how do you know when a person is demon possessed well remember that demon possession I've addressed this 
uh, prior, but I'll say it again. The demon possession is not control. It's really uh, in the Bible being demonized or demon possessed, as a, it's translated, it really had to do with a person having regular or intermittent influence by demons. It didn't mean that the demons assumed control of that person and their personality. That's not, that wasn't the case. It was regular or intermittent influence. Either one. So anyway, you can tell a person who is demon possessed by the patterns that they show in their life and their activities, their words and things of that nature. You can see the influence by their actions and what they say, whether there's demon possession. So I want to get back to this one thing. Let's start from the top. I did a, a podcast in the past about the religious spirit of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm going to jump out here on a limb. I'm just going to move things kind of uh, at a different pace for a second because I'm going to say something that may shock some of you because it shocks it shocks you because as a Jehovah's Witnesses, we have this belief about who Jehovah is and we're connecting Jehovah with the God of the Bible. But I'm going to say this, that the Jehovah of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the, the Yahweh of the Bible. Or Jave in English of the Bible. Now I'm going to jump out on that limb and say that. Now that's maybe a bit shocking. It takes a while for this to sink in. I think you got to get away from the organization for a while to make that point because you know we were so indoctrinated with the name Jehovah, the three syllable name Jehovah, where just on a basic level the God of the Bible, Yahweh, did not have three vowel points. It didn't have three syllables. It was just two. I think it started in uh, Genesis chapter 2, where at some point they put in the, the third vowel point. Then when they start taking the vowel points from Adonai and putting it with the tetragrammaton, and they came up with Jehovah, uh, uh, as it's pronounced in English, so it was three syllables. But it, it was always two syllables. But then it became three. Okay. So Jehovah, uh, the, the name was taken out of the Bible and replaced mostly with Lord or God. And then it was left in in those four verses in the King James Bible, but it was left in as Jehovah. Okay, no problem. That's the way it was. But then with Jehovah's Witnesses, they started p replacing the name or the tetragrammaton with Jehovah. They start putting it back in. Because the tetragrammaton, yeah, it's in the scriptures, you know, thousands of times. And that's not, I'm not saying anything about that. But what I'm saying is that the God of the religion is not the God of the scriptures. And you can tell that it's not the God of the scriptures based on the way the people act. And when you look at it, and when you really look at it, from the top down, you can really start to see, you compare what you see with Jehovah's Witnesses from the top on down and then go back into the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament and see if it's the same God in the Scriptures. Now you can look at, for instance, let's start with the top, the governing body. Now, does the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses reflect the nature of the God of the Scriptures? I'm not going to say no, because they don't run their organization like the God of the Bible would run his. The Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, God, the, especially with the governing body as reflected by the governing body, as they see him, he's like a, a really, you know, prideful, communist type God. Seriously. I mean, you think about it. He is, this God of the governing body is a very prideful and selfish God. And think about it. This God demands a lot of stuff from his servants, but he doesn't give anything back to his servants, but demands everything. And, and just like with the, you know, if you heard the stories or even read the stories about communism and how they wanted neighbor to report on neighbor. So everybody was a spy for the government. 
And it's the same way at Jehovah's Witnesses. Everyone spies on everyone else. And then they report what they see to the authorities, the elders, and it goes on up. And then now you always brought on the question of suspicion because of your actions. And, and I have to admit, you know, I participated in that too. You spied on the private lives of people. And it went down to just some really crazy things. Think about this. Now, I don't know how it is in your area, but in my area, uh, a lot of people barbecue on the holidays. Now, if you got Jehovah's Witnesses around you and you barbecue on some of the holidays, then they take it as you're celebrating the holidays. And then they go report that. Say anything that you say negatively about the governing body. Oh, shh. You better not say anything negative about the governing body. Anything you say negative about the organization. Oh, man, that's, that's like high treason to the governing body. Because that's the God that they serve. It's like a communist God. And then he demands everything. I mean, stop and think about it. He wants you to volunteer your time. Volunteer your time. You're not paid for it. Volunteer your time to speak about him. And then the people enforce it. The authorities enforce that. Because that's how they feel that their God is. So you got to report at least one hour of talking about Jehovah a month. One hour. The national average, you know, in the United States, well, I was just going to go out and say, it's 10 hours. 10. They want you to average, volunteer your time. And they, and they track it. That's the main thing. You speak about God and we want to track what you do. So therefore, you have to volunteer 10 hours of your time a month to keep pace with the national average. And if you're not at the 10 hours a month, then you are a low hour publisher. And we'll get into the term publisher by itself. But here it is. You are tracked every month about how much time and expect you to be truthful about how much time you're reporting of the time spent talking to others about Jehovah. And then you can volunteer even more time. They kind of put pressure on you to auxiliary pioneer and then a regular pioneer. You know, a regular pioneer at this stage, 70 hours a month, voluntary, volunteer time, 70 hours a month to go and preach about the God Jehovah. And you don't get paid for this now. This is volunteer time. And if you can't keep pace with it, then they're going to remove you from that position. I mean, think about that. And it's, it's people who have gotten sick and they cannot keep up their volunteer pace, but they want to become what's called an infirm pioneer, which means they want to stay on the pioneer list to continue to be called by that title of volunteer time of which they're not paid. But it does something to them emotionally if they get removed. It's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, and then think about this. If you become an employee of the kind of, uh, of that organization, they don't give you a 401k, no savings. You're not really paid much. You're taking a vow of obedience and poverty to do it. So you give them some authority, yeah, true. But you're not paid anything. And so once you get past a certain age where... You can't go out in the regular market and make money for yourself. Then they got you. They got you for the rest of your natural life because you can't afford in life to go out on your own and start work at 40 years old, 50 years old. So don't get into any trouble. And you're going to be re relying on the kindness of strangers to maybe help you get a job. And what kind of job are you going to get at that stage? What kind of savings will you build at that stage? See, they got you, and you are trapped into that, and you get nothing from it. All your time, all your years of volunteer service, or even service where they are, you know, caring for your needs, like, you know, up at Bethel, or Special Pioneer, and all that kind of stuff, you know, Circuit Overseer, well, they, they are paying for covering your needs, but you're not really making anything of your own, so that God keeps you trapped. In the service to him because you can't leave. What what th there are Bethelites that are up there, and they're they're Bethelites who report out about things, you know, that are against the organization. I mean, they they're spilling the beans on what's really going on up there. 
And they're talking to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, telling them what's going on up at Bethlehem, what the governing body's doing. But you know what? They can't leave. They have to do this stuff in secret because they're not cared for. If they get caught and disfellowshipped or kicked out, they're on their own. No matter how many years of service that they put into that religion. So think about that type of God. Think of what he demands. Is that the God of the Bible? No, 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 not at all. That's not the, the, the Yahweh of the scriptures. That's not who the nation of Israel served. So when James said that God is love, yeah, he is, but the Jehovah of Jehovah's Witnesses ain't. He's definitely not a God of love. So who is he? I let me go ahead and stick, uh, step out a little bit further on that. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is just my opinion. Me and a, another Christian were talking about this. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ, their Jesus, is Michael the Archangel, right? So the Catholics believe that uh, that Saint Michael the Archangel, they, they believe in him too. But you know who they associated him with? They associated him with Thor, Scandinavian God. And Thor was the son of Odin. So look, all you Marvel fans, they do some research on that. See what type of God in reality, you know, that was in the movie. See what type of God uh, Odin was. And compare him to the God of Jehovah's Witnesses and see if he's the same. You know, because I just wonder. I really do. I wonder who that angel is, that wicked angel that's running that organization. Because you see how he is. Very prideful. Think of how the governing body acted with all of the child sexual abuse cases in the United States. The, the Australian Royal Commission, how they acted then. Just think about that. See, that's why I wonder who that God is. But I can tell you this. The God of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the God of the Scriptures. So when you stop and think about things from that perspective. Now again, I just want to emphasize it. The God of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the God of the Bible. Their Jehovah is not Yahweh of the Bible. That's what I'm saying. And you can tell by how the people act. When you think about it from that perspective, we have to really look at the spirit realm. See, the Bible is full of descriptions of activities of the spirit realm. In Ephesians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, they talk about the spiritual warfare You know that we have. Who are we battling? It's not humans. We're battling wicked spirits. And that particularly... They're talking about the wicked spirits that rule us in the heavenly places. These are the wicked angels. Satan is wicked angels. But again, Daniel chapter 8, Revelation chapter 12, they make it clear that there are wicked angels. And Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke is very clear that Jesus was battling demons. He was dealing with demons. He wasn't really battling them because he had so much authority. But Satan came off of his throne. And got down in the region and was influencing things. And it was very clear in the scriptures that these demons were inside of people. The, these demons were in humans, influencing them to act a certain way. And Jesus really exposed it. But, you know, the, the Jews also knew this. They understood this. And in fact, they had ways of determining whether... A person had a demon or not. They would look at their conduct. They would look at their words and say, yeah, you got a demon. They said it about Jesus. You have a demon. Why would anyone want to kill a man like you? See, so they looked to see. And, and what did Jesus say about uh, John the Baptist? The people were saying, especially the rulers, that John the Baptist, based on his conduct, had a demon, which he didn't. But they said he did. See, so they were looking at conduct and words and things to determine whether a person had a demon. So they, they got pretty skilled at it. And then they misunderstood things, of course, with Jesus Christ. But they assumed that people had demons. So there was very, it was very obvious to the Jews that there was a spirit realm. And that the spirit realm affected the physical realm. So when we look at things from that perspective, it would be good for us to really take heart 
to understand what that scripture means in Acts chapter 2 and in Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'm, I'm leading this up to say that as we were taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, we were taught so minimally about the spirit realm, minimally about the demon possession, that we should get to understand about the spirit realm, about demon possession, and then understand things about deliverance. When the scriptures say everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, deliverance, or de that, that word saved also means deliver. Salvation is where the term deliverance comes from. So it's not just we're saved in terms of getting life, you know, at, at the end of whenever this, this system or age ends and then be resurrected. That you look for salvation, you save from sin and death, and you look for salvation somewhere down the road. The term saved actually had more of an immediate understanding. So it was near future. So you're in a dangerous situation and you're looking to be saved from it, rescued, delivered. So I think, uh, that's why I'm starting this out about us as ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. We need to understand the term salvation or deliverance or being saved and what that means. Because look, there are religious spirits. So you have a God over the religions, a wicked angel over deliverance who has a lot of authority. But then you have demons in association with them that possess people. And you have to be delivered from that. And a, and a religious spirit is a, a religious spirit, let me say that. Those are demons who do take on that persona and have an effect on the people who are in that religion. So we may quite likely have had that. One of the things is that when you have a domineering type of leadership that's very controlling and, and, and uh, burdens the people like the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, and we're under that influence, then those religious spirits come into us. So that's what I'm going to discuss on my podcast, uh, on part two. But I wanted to get this one out about calling on the name of the Lord, being saved and understanding the effect of Jehovah's Witnesses spiritually on us as people. So look, I'm going to do a part two on it. I want to thank everyone for checking this one out and hit that like and subscribe button for me so that uh, you'll know when the next one comes out and then we get this algorithm out to more people. All right, everybody. Take care. Talk to you soon.